Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Robert Whitman, author of this amazing book, Priceless, How I Went Undercover to Rescue the World's Stolen Treasures. Talk to me, your background. They call you the Indiana Jones of the FBI. <laughs> Not really. I, you know, I was a special agent, Lorraine, and, and thank you, by the way, for having me on. This is a great treat for me. Uh, I love Santa Fe. New Mexico is one of my favorite states. Uh, since the book came out, I've been probably in 40 different states, uh, yeah. all the way from Alaska to Florida, and, and New Mexico is just one of my favorites. So uh, it's just great to be here, and thanks for having me on. And uh, as an FBI agent, I was an agent for 20 years, uh, a street agent, uh, and what I did was I specialized in art theft investigations, art crime investigations in general, because theft is only one small part of the overall art crime industry. Um, there's also frauds, forgeries, and fakes, and quite honestly, people don't realize that the frauds and forgeries and fakes are a bigger part of that art crime industry than just theft. Well, um, you, you, you mentioned that, let's talk about how much money is involved in sure. the art industry and then how much is involved in the fraud, forgery, and theft. Absolutely. Well, the, the entire art industry worldwide is about a $200 billion industry worldwide. Okay. $200 billion with a B. Let's just, so that puts it up with agriculture and oh, yeah. petroleum. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge $200 billion industry. a year worldwide. That's a correct. Year. Okay. And about, uh, about $6 billion of that is the illicit cultural property market, which is uh, frauds, forgeries, and thefts, and looting from uh, you know pre-Columbian countries, and, uh, from places like Thailand, from places like the Middle East. So those are all parts of the art crime industry. The United States represents about 40% of the uh, art industry worldwide, which is an $80 billion industry. And, um in, in all the crimes of the world, it comes to what? Guns, drugs, money laundering, humans, and then art. Human humans, trafficking. Trafficking, that's right, and then and art. art. So it's about the fifth, fifth largest uh, international crime, according to uh, Interpol records. Um, now, now, to put that just in kind of a little bit of perspective, the, the $80 billion in the United States, um, if you look at the, the four major industries of sports, uh, I'm, I'm talking about yeah. football, baseball, hockey, and uh, basketball, they all come to about a $25 billion industry per year. Well, the art industry in the U.S. is almost three times or more than three times the size of all four major sports. So it just goes to show that Americans, we do love our art. Well, New Mexico is particularly art-oriented, and Santa Fe is, as I say, the third largest art market in the world. I don't know if that's true or not. But you bring um, such a wealth of experience. Let me, let me go back to the beginning. Uh, when you were on the FBI, you were the only person assigned to art crime because they considered it a property crime? Well, yeah. Victimless? You know, yeah, the FBI uh, in 1988, when I first started there, uh, basically there was no art crime team. And we didn't have an art squad until 2005. Uh, and the reason for that is because art theft and, and fraud and forgery, it's all considered a property crime. It's on the same level as car theft. But as I kept saying, you know, you don't investigate the theft of a Monet the same way you would do a Chevrolet. It's two yeah. different <laughs> types of investigations. And, the tr and that is the truth. So, I mean, uh, it didn't come until 2005 that we started an art crime team, which was really, uh, I, I give credit to the, uh, the, to the uh, director at that time and uh, what they decided to do. Um, they, they gave us eight agents nationwide. It's still small at that point because they, if you look at the Carbonieri in Italy, they have more than 300 investigators doing nothing but art crime investigation. And the French have 35 in what they call the OCBC in Paris. So, but we had eight at that point in 2005. Now today there's, I believe, 14 agents on the art crime team. And they've recovered more than $140 million worth of material, uh, over 1,000 items from 12 different countries. So I'm, I'm happy with them. I'm proud of them. Well, in your book, Priceless, you tell some of these, I mean, talk about thrilling, some of these adventures that you've gone undercover. But one of the points that you keep making is that they're not only stealing a piece of art, they're stealing our cultural heritage. Exactly. And, and this is irreplaceable stuff. They're stealing memories, they're stealing our identity, and they're stealing our heritage. Exactly. And, and it's not just the heritage of the United States. Uh, it's the heritage of the entire world. 
Um, you know, many of the cases I did involved cultural property. In fact, that's what we call it. That's what they call it in the FBI. It's not art theft. It's called cultural property mm -hmm. crime. Because a lot of the cases are not necessarily pieces of art. They're pieces of our history. I remember one case I did involving a, uh, a, a stolen battle flag. Uh, the flag was carried into battle by one of the first African-American regiments mm. that was created during the Civil War. Um, it was the 12th Regiment Corps d'Afrique, and, and an individual had stolen that while it was en route from one fort to another. So we did an undercover operation. We were able to recover that piece, but literally five individuals were shot out from under that flag carrying it into battle. Uh -huh. And the representation of that, the, the value was only about $30,000 compared uh -huh. to other items I got back worth tens of millions, but it wasn't the money. It was the fact that, you know, for the first time, these individuals were fighting for their own freedom, these African Americans, and fighting for the freedom of all their children to come. And this flag represented that, that fight for freedom in that battle. Wow. Yeah. So it was important. So the money's really not always what, what, you know, generates the interest or what creates the cultural heritage. It depends on the item. Well, uh, I've seen a few presentations you have, and you talk about, uh, well, one of the things you say is that the real art uh, is not stealing right. the, the piece, but the art is trying to sell it. Exactly. How do you sell a Rembrandt or a Renoir when everyone knows it? Uh, well, the real art in an art theft is not the stealing. It is the selling. And, and, and that's really the problem. Um, you know, when thieves go out, they read the paper, they see these big auction records, and they think to themselves, well, if I can steal this, this painting, it's worth tens of millions of dollars. If I could just get 10% on the black market, that, that way I'd, I'd make, make a big score. But the truth is, once you steal the painting, it's worth nothing. And the reason for that is the, the value of the art in the art market is, is involving three things. It's the, the provenance, the history of the art, the authenticity, proving that it's correct and it's real, and then good title. If you don't have good title or one of those three things, really you don't have any value. So, of course, stolen property does not carry good title with it, therefore <laughs> it can't be transferred. Yeah. So you have nothing. And yeah. the thieves, uh, usually what happens is they, they find that out when they try to sell oh, it back no. to the police or, or it gets uh, seized in some type of auction or something. Well, you found in, in your studies of this that 90% of these big heists are inside jobs, someone related right. that has access, not necessarily the employee or, uh, you know, the head of the museum, but somebody that comes in and out and knows how things work. Right. And only 10% are robberies or burglaries or armed robberies. Um, you, let, we're going to look at a picture of uh, the, the Houston Rem Renoir heist. Right. And you actually, let's, we'll take a moment and look at this picture. This is a wanted poster mm -hmm. for an armed robbery, a, a painting that was stolen in Texas. And we'll just take a look at it. It's, it's by Renoir, and it's called Madeline. Madeline, yeah, yeah. with flowers. Right. Yes. And so tell us a little about this. Well, what happened there was uh, in 2011, uh, an individual went into a woman's home in Houston, and he, at gunpoint, he uh, demanded cash and jewelry. Well, the, the woman said, I didn't have the cash and jewelry available at the house. It was in the bank, in the bank vault, and that uh, she had nothing for him. Well, he, he, at that point, he was going to go upstairs, and she was afraid because her, her son was upstairs. So she said, look, take a picture. And, and the individual was dressed all in black, had the pistol. He said, what picture? And she pointed to this, this painting and said, if you want to take some, take that painting. So he, he basically said he called it the fat lady <laughs> when, oh. he, when, he said, when, he, when he pointed to it. And uh, he made off with the painting. It's, uh, it was very valuable, close to a million dollars in value. And uh, at this point, there's a $25,000 reward leading to the recovery of the painting. It's being offered by uh, the insurance company. And it's actually now been put on the FBI's art crime team, top 10 art crimes. Mm. So it's been listed as one of the top 10 at this point that the FBI is uh, interested in recovering. Well, um, one of the most recent and unsolved crimes was the Gardner heist. Indeed. So tell us a little about that. Well, in 1990, two individuals dressed as Boston police officers. They went into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. In Boston. And in Boston, yeah. exactly. It was on St. Patty's Day night. And after they went in, they made their way and they tricked the guards to let them in. They tied the two guards up, two young college students, and they went around the museum for the next hour and some odd minutes, and they stole 13 objects of art. Uh, that occurred in 1990. Uh, none of those artworks have ever been recovered. Not, not a single one has been brought back. At the time, the value of that heist was about $300 million. And since that time, the value has gone up to almost $500 million. And uh, there is a $5 million reward for any information leading to the recovery of the paintings. And so it's very unusual that uh, these paintings will be gone that long with no, no tips, no hints. But 
hopefully, uh, you know, someone out there will know where these pieces are and we'll, we'll get them back to us. They're all listed on the FBI website. So the photographs of the paintings are there. So, so your listeners and readers and, and, and uh, uh, television watchers can look at the FBI art crime team website and see the paintings. And this is the largest property crime in United States history. That's, yeah, isn't that amazing? That the single largest property crime in U.S. history was the theft of paintings from a museum. It's mm. $500 million worth. And that's the single property crime at one time that was taken. So, Briefly tell us what law was enacted by Ted Kennedy as a result of the Gardner heist. Yeah, well, in 1996, Congress passed a statute that was put forth by Ted Kennedy. It was called the Theft of Major Artwork Statute which makes it a federal violation to steal a painting from a museum in the United States. It's considered a piece of cultural property, so therefore Congress has made it a, 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 given it federal protection. And what the law says, it's very interesting, Lorraine, because the law says that if a painting is worth $5,000 or more and over 100 years old, that it falls under this statute. Or if it's worth over $100,000, any age, it falls under the statute as well. So as a result, that makes it a federal crime, which gives the FBI or Homeland Security first jurisdiction to go in and do an investigation. Now, an interesting piece of advice I've heard you give is that if one of our audience or viewers was mm -hmm. happening to be interested in buying some art online, and you said that the biggest complaint that the FBI g gets is what? It's basically, it's cyber fraud. It's uh, eBay, fraud from eBay. Yeah. yeah. Well, people who are defrauded by buying pieces on eBay. Now, it's not eBay. eBay no, is of simply the not. carrier. It's the people who are putting material on eBay. And a lot of times these things are not what they are purported to be. So what I always say is, you know, if the Monet has an A in it, don't buy it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or if there's two S's in that Picasso on eBay, it's not going to be right. You know, right. be careful for, for what you buy. And you also said that if you are buying art online, be sure that some of it, the the communications are on the internet because that's wireless across state be, lines right. fraud, and the, right. then the feds can help you. That's correct. There's a, there's violations of wire fraud, and mail fraud that are often often used, <clears throat> and what that basically says is that someone defrauds someone else using the, the mails, the wires, FedEx or UPS, anything like that, or email, then it could be a federal violation, a federal crime that's been committed, and that gives jurisdiction for the FBI or Homeland Security to do an investigation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, y you uh, often will show the movie stars that mm. are in all, <laughs> I love this part, right. the movie stars that are in... Uh, like Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief and Pierce Brosnan in, in The Thomas Crown Affair. And they're debonair, dashing, intelligent, charming, cultivated, sophisticated people. And then you show us pictures, which we cannot show <laughs> because they, these are the real people, yeah. of these skanky, low-life right. hoods <laughs> that are stealing yeah. all this precious art. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, it, it's not really uh, like, like Hollywood portrays it. Uh, it is theft, and a lot of times it's armed robbery, it's gangs. Um, you know, art theft, in some, in some respects, in certain countries, is considered a gateway crime. Uh, and what we mean by that is, you know, they're doing many different types of crime, and art theft is just one of them. I remember one gang that I was infiltrating in Marseille, uh, it was called the Breeze de Mer, and they were involved in aggravated assault, uh, selling stolen mm. ships, they were doing drug dealings, they, were, uh, they actually were involved with murder. Uh, and so it was many different things that they did. One of the things they did was also steal paintings from the museum in Nice. So we were able to apprehend them doing that situation and, and get them uh, prosecuted and convicted at, and for stealing those paintings. But they were involved in many different types of uh, uh, criminal enterprises. We're speaking today with Bob Whitman, who wrote this wonderful book, Priceless, How I Went Uncover, Undercover to Rescue the World's Stolen Treasures. I keep referring to these thieves in the, as males. Mm. Have right. there been at all women art thieves? Well, you know, there, there have been in the past, uh, but I have to say that in my, throughout my career, um, I only had one occasion where I arrested a woman involved in art theft. Mm -hmm. um, it, was a, it was a gang. It was five individuals, four men and a woman, and they were going uh, through three different states. It was New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. And, and what they were doing is they were going up to dealers that they knew these dealers. One of, the, one of them was a dealer, so he knew who they were, all mm -hmm. the other dealers were. And he would send these, this gang, one, and the girl would go up and knock on the door, and she'd have flowers. And she was going to be delivering a flower bouquet to the person. That's what it looked like. So they would open the door. Uh -huh. Well, at that point, the, the other two guys would bum rush the person when right. they opened the door. They would hit him with a taser, you know, knock him out, or with a gun. 
and then go in and rob them. They did seven robberies before we finally ca caught up with them. Mm. Um, and we're given 15 to 25 year sentences on that situation because of the use of the gun and the robberies. But the young lady in the case got a five year sentence because and for for being an accessory and aiding yeah. and abetting. Yeah. Uh, one of the stories that you tell that I love, because it kind of has to do with, is there honor among thieves? Mm -hmm. uh, in Copenhagen, you have undercover footage of you're recovering a Rembrandt self-portrait etched on copper, this right. rare, rare piece. And um, describe the gentleman. You finally set up, you know, the, the, your backup is in the next mm -hmm. room. You're just the buyer. The guy comes into the hotel room carrying what? What do they usually have once they've stolen a painting? Well, in this situation, they, they had done the robbery using machine guns, and they had oh, gone yikes. and hit the uh, Swedish National Museum in Stockholm. Uh, so they, they had a really a good good robbery set up. They went in, they stole the paintings, made their getaway in a high-speed boat. They had set up uh, two car bombs to stop the other police from being able to respond. It took the, took the police more than 20 minutes to get to the museum, so they had made their getaway, like I say, in the speedboat. So what we did was we did an investigation, and over about a two-and-a-half-month period of, of meeting with these individuals, we finally convinced them that I was a buyer for the Russian mob, is what, uh -huh. what the story was. And we were going to buy this $35 million Rembrandt that they had stolen for $250,000. So eventually they did show up. Uh, they had come in. They, they came down from Sweden to Copenhagen, which is a four-hour train ride, and they carried a, a bag with them that uh, looked like it had the painting in it. But in the end, there was no painting in the bag. They had sent another person down the night before who had brought the painting in. The bag was just a decoy. So had we done anything, had the police in Sweden or the police Rush in, them or in something. Copenhagen done anything, it would have been a problem. As, as it turned out, they did bring them, uh, and we were able to arrest them and recover the painting. And isn't this the, the case where he brings it in, and it's the painting in the frame? And, and right. usually they cut out the canvas, roll it up, and put it in their pant leg or something. <laughs> and you did, I think, remark. Yeah. It's still in the frame. And what did the guy say? Uh, he looked at me uh, kind of aghast. He said, of course, it's a Rembrandt. Yeah, right. Honor uh, among thieves. Exactly. Like as, if, uh, you know, <laughs> as if he was a, uh, an art lover. Truth was, he was just in it for the money. But even he understood. He had a, an amazing piece of, of, of human genius. Yeah. And this, uh, this piece was done in 1630 when Rembrandt was 24 years old. It's the only one he ever did on copper, one of the, one of the uh, self-portraits. And I always say that you know, art history and art theft are two different things. They, 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 the art history is one side of the coin, but the art business is the theft crime side of the coin. But sometimes they do intermix because in this case, you know, um, Rembrandt did more than a hundred of these what they call tronies, these these, these headshots that he would do, mm -hmm. pictures on himself. And the reason he did them, uh, it wasn't because he loved himself. It was because he had a very cheap model. He didn't have to yeah, right, a model, right, right, yeah. You know, and it was great advertising. Yeah. So right there, you see the art business is coinciding with uh -huh. the stolen property. I mean, he, it was all about business. Tell me, Bob, how did you go from, you know, the basic FBI officer to, now people say that you're a self-taught art historian, <laughs> and clearly the love is there, yeah. though. How did you end up specializing in fine art? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I didn't really specialize in fine art. I specialized in all cultural property. So I did everything from eagle feathered war bonnets. Oh, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, to uh, battle flags, as I said. To, at one point, I recovered a, an original copy of the Bill of Rights that was stolen during the Civil War and was being offered for sale. It was a, it was a copy that belonged to North Carolina. Uh, so it was the, the whole gamut from Rembrandt to, to writings. And, and the way I got into it was when I was first assigned to Philadelphia, there were three museum thefts that had occurred and we did the investigation and basically because I was the new guy I got those cases yeah, okay yeah. so um, and, and what, what had happened was that which was interesting my, my parents were in the antiques business so I grew up in that business so I did know how to do an art deal mm -hmm. and really when it comes right down to working undercover in the art market um, it's really all about knowing how to do an art deal you know how to do the business end of the uh, of the transaction not so much the history but knowing how to make a deal well, let's go back to the, let's, we're going to look at a picture. Let's talk about this. This is, we're going to show a picture of a war bonnet made of mm -hmm. eagle feathers right. that you recovered. It was Geronimo's bonnet. Can you give us the short, short version of, well, of course. why, yeah. what the status of dealing in eagle feathers is and what happened with this beautiful war bonnet? Oh, well, it was, uh, it was being offered for sale on the internet. And uh, I, we got a tip, the FBI got a tip that this piece was being offered. It was being described as Geronimo's war bonnet. And uh, it basically was a, a, a five foot or five and a half foot long eagle feather war bonnet. Uh, it was worn by Geronimo in, a, in, in the early 1900s when he danced at what they called the last powwow. Uh, 
mm -hmm. in Oklahoma territory. Oklahoma was going to become a state. So for a week before it became a state, and while it was still a territory, there was a, a major Indian dance. And uh, Geronimo was said to, according to newspaper reports, to dance on the last day in the last hour. So they ex escorted him from Fort Sill, because uh, at the time he was still a prisoner, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the government. They escorted him from Fort Sill, a Texas Ranger did, to the uh, dance where he wore a buckskin outfit, uh, moccasins, and he was given the war bonnet to wear in the dance. So as a result of that dance, he did it. Everyone watched. They said that 10,000 people stood in awe when he got up and did his, uh, his final dance. And then he was escorted back to, to Fort Sill. And as a result, uh, and, and cause, because the Texas Ranger treated him nicely, he gave the outfit to the Texas Ranger. Wow. And eventually that was given to another individual. And uh, it came down through the family. And then that person decided he wanted to, tr to trade it in for $1.2 million. And as a result of that, because it was uh, Eagle Feathers, basically it's, a, it's a Ill illegal United States itself to traffic in those, uh, those feathers because of the, uh, the Bald Eagle Feather Act and a number of other, uh, Lacey Act and a number of other wildlife uh, laws, uh, we were able to do a, a case and, and recover the piece. Now, we were more interested in recovering the item you know, not allowing it to go outside the country mm -hmm. than we were in, in, you know, prosecuting anyone in that situation. So basically it worked out for the best for everyone. And um, the, the, the war bonnet now is, is back, to, back to where it belongs. I believe it's, it's being in, held in the custody of the Comanche tribe and the, um, I believe, the Apache tribe as well. So they kind of share it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to get to two other things okay. really quickly. Right. Um, the, the Operation Cuba and the Goya Swing. Let's take yeah. a look at a little picture here now. You are standing beside the painting by Goya right. of this the swing, it's the called. Swing. It was it was another private home, uh, yeah. our collection that was robbed. Tell us the short version. Of short version, that was stolen in uh, 2002. It was stolen in Madrid, uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, while uh, a woman was on vacation. Uh, her name was Esther Koplowitz. Esther was is, uh, was married to a steel magnet in uh, in Spain. And what happened was a couple of individuals went into the house. They stole 17 paintings total. Uh, uh, we developed information, we being the FBI, uh, from from uh, from sources that uh, we could get infiltrate this group. So we did. Uh, we traveled to Madrid. Uh, offered uh, basically $10 million for the paintings. Uh, we weren't going to pay it, but we yeah. were going to offer it, and we're able to recover all 17 paintings wow. in an in a, in a, in a upscale hotel in, uh, in Madrid. So all those pieces will be, are, are all given to this country of Spain. So at some point, uh, the, those pieces will be in the Prado. They'll be in the museum. That, that swing is, a, is a really a, a cool masterpiece. Yeah. It's worth about $15 million from what I understand, and it was really a neat piece to be able to get back. Now let's go to a New Mexico piece. Let's mm -hmm. look for a moment at this golden monkey head um, that was actually here in the New Mexico History That's Museum. Yeah. Can you give us the short version of that? Uh, it's, first of all, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's a piece. It's an iconic piece. Uh, it comes from the Moche culture of Peru, probably around 300 A.D., so it's almost 2,000 years old. And it was discovered in a tomb in the, in the Moche, Moche culture and was, and was basically looted. Uh, it ended up in a collection in California and then came to Santa Fe where it was put on exhibit and, and given as a, a gift to the, to the New Mexico History Museum, I believe, in the Palace of Governors, and it was put on display. Um, eventually, though, we were able to show that the piece came out of the country of Peru. It should go back to Peru because it was in violation of their National Stolen Property Act. And so um, the, the museum, along with a number of other individuals, were able to, to give it back. They, uh, in 2011, there was a ceremony at the Peruvian Embassy where uh, the, the state of New Mexico was involved, the, the museum was involved. They did the right thing. Right. Yeah. Now, um, again, in, it, you have had such adventures. I mean, the, the danger, the undercover on yachts with beautiful women mm. and hit men, you know, it's quite an a, a well, Those beautiful line. women were FBI agents now. So okay, all right. Yeah. State, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they're all my colleagues. So you've <laughs> had this this high-intensity, wonderful, ad adventure-filled life, but now you've retired after 20 years of the FBI, yeah. but you're putting all your expertise to use. What are you doing now? Well, I have a company called Robert Whitman Incorporated, and what we do is we do... Uh, uh, you know, we do research, provenance research, due diligence, uh, expert witness testimony. And one of the things I, I'm doing lately, and it was, uh, I'm seeing a real need for, because of the problem with authentication, and there's so many questions now about, about what's real and what's not real in the art industry, mm -hmm. and because of the value of these pieces, that uh, we're doing compliance due diligence surveys. So what we'll do is we'll go to, a, say, an, uh, an auction house or to a dealer, 
uh, more than likely, and we'll look at their inventory. And we'll say, okay, these pieces that you have, we'll do a provenance research, and then we'll write a, a third-person report that either says yay or nay on what we found, that the provenance <coughs> was correct or incorrect, depending on the situation. Uh, hopefully, you know, it works out for the best. Well, you're also writing a book. I can hardly Indeed, wait. Because yeah. this is Priceless is a very favorite book of mine. So what are you working on? Well, we have a new book coming out next September. It's called The Devil's Diary. And Harper Collins is the one who's going to be putting that one out. And basically, it's, it's a, uh, a story about a, a diary that we, we were able to uh, uh, recover last year uh, in my new company. And it was, it was a diary. It's a 400-page diary written by Alfred Rosenberg. And Rosenberg was the chief civil scientist of the Third Reich, uh, along with Hitler. And so he was the guy who came up with the idea of the Aryan races, the, the nations, and, and the top of the food chain being the Aryans. Also the idea of the Fuhrer Museum and the, and the stealing of the artwork in Europe. And was instrumental in the, um, you know, the whole idea of the Holocaust and, and the killing of, of, of Jews as well as gypsies and many other different uh, individuals. So he's a, he's a pretty bad character as far as it all went. Um, ultimately, he had written a diary for, for about five years between 1939 and 1945. And it was used against him and Goring at the Nuremberg trials, but then it went disappeared. And so it was gone since 1945, and we've just been able to recover that last year for the U.S. Holocaust Museum. But they only use a portion of it, just a, yeah. a third of it, a quarter of it? Yeah, about at the a Nuremberg quarter of it trials. Right, had been translated and transcribed uh, before, it was, before it was taken. So three quarters of it has never been read, transcribed, or, 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 or put out there. And so we're going to be doing that for well, the first what's time. What's in it? What's in those other <laughs> 300 pages? Well, you have to, you're going to have to read Devil's Diary. I guess I'm year. going to yeah. have to. It's called Devil's Diary, the Hunt for the, uh, the High Priest of the Third Reich. Well, you'll have to come back when that book definitely, is out. Definitely, definitely. Would love to. Our guest today is Robert Whitman, author of Priceless, How I Went Undercover to Retrieve the World's Stolen Treasures. It's a fabulous read. Thank you for joining us. Lorraine, thanks for having me. It's great to be a here. A pleasure. And I'm Lorraine Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.